So economics and AI have indeed been close bedfellows since the inception of AI already. For example, the whole concept of uh, agents who maximize utility uh, was originally an economic concept that AI uh, has uh, taken on and has put kind of at the center uh, of a lot of the optimization problems. Now, the other, uh, and perhaps for this topic today, more relevant uh, issue is that economics is in some ways an unabashedly materialist science. It focuses on questions of tangible resource allocation. And uh, one of the, that has certain benefits and certain disadvantages. Maybe one disadvantage is that it may at times appear a bit reductionist. But one benefit is that it cuts through some of our anthropocentric biases and uh, allows us to take a, a kind of more dismal perspective on uh, what's going on in human society. And what I will argue is it allows us to actually see more clearly the changing material tides facing humanity. So let me start uh, with a big picture. Uh, first of all, uh, I wanted to emphasize that intelligence uh, is from a materialist perspective the defining characteristic that set humanity apart from other animals, and it is what has allowed us to rule planet Earth. So um, we know that in recent decades, narrow machine intelligence uh, has caught on and surpassed human intelligence in specific area after area. And one of the big questions uh, that uh, this brings up is, will it at some point also eclipse human intelligence? Or as a lot of people say, well, the real question is, when will it? I think at this point, the jury is still out. But uh, there is uh, interesting arguments on both sides. And uh, one of the things uh, that does is it really puts our anthropocentric view of the world in question. So now taking a more distinctly economic perspective, I want to put AI and uh, the recent advances in AI uh, in kind of a, a slightly bigger context uh, into the context of the arc of technological progress. So before the Industrial Revolution, roughly before 1700, humanity, since it came about something like 150 or 75,000 years ago, uh, lived in a Malthusian world. So Malthusian world, uh, that basically means that uh, the vast majority of humanity uh, lived at subsistence levels. Uh, we had just enough uh, to get by, uh, we were permanently on the brink of starvation, and living standards were pretty miserable. And the reason why that was, was that any time we made any progress, population growth would eat up the fruits of that progress. So let's say, for example, uh, when we invented better ways of uh, tending to our fields, or better ways of raising uh, food animals, uh, the population adjusted, and uh, we ended up again in a state where everybody had just enough to survive. So this Malthusian world, uh, life at the subsistence level, was in some ways a pretty bleak world, but it was also the kind of world that pretty much all animals live in. Uh, it's a, a, a matter of, uh, how should I say, uh, evolutionary forces that um, species uh, population numbers expand until they'll fill the available living space. And that's what humanity used to do up until 1700. And then all of a sudden, in the mid 18th, uh, end of uh, uh, 18th century, the Industrial Revolution happened. And all of a sudden, the invention of machines 
uh, or specific machines at the time in the textile sector, started a process that has lasted uh, at least until today and is likely to continue, uh, that has led to unprecedented growth and suddenly also to increases in living standards. So you can see I have on the right hand uh, of uh, this slide here, I have two graphs. They actually depict exactly the same data series, but one of them using a, a regular scale and the other one using a logarithmic scale. So let's maybe start uh, by looking at the logarithmic scale at the bottom. And what you can see there is, this is essentially a measure of living standards in England, because that's where I had the longest uh, data series available, from 1250 up until now. What you can see is, for uh, the first few centuries in this graph, basically up until 1700, living standards oscillated around a pretty tight uh, interval. So they were basically all around uh, what corresponds here in this graph to 1,000. And there were some minor ups and some minor downs, but there really wasn't any material progress if you looked at the fate of the average human. The person living in 1250 had essentially the same living standard as the person living in 1700. What happened after that was the Industrial Revolution occurred. Um, <clears throat> we invented ways to mechanize uh, the production of some of the essential um, goods that we rely on. First it was uh, cloth, uh, soon after a lot of other things followed. And uh, let's now turn to the top graph. You can see that exponential growth uh, started uh, to occur. And in fact, since 1700, living standards in the, U uh, in the UK, uh, or in England specifically, have risen about 40-fold. So the average person in England nowadays has 40 times the material wealth that they had in 1700. And that happened over the span of basically three centuries after we had millennia and millennia of stagnation in the standard of living. So let me give a somewhat evolutionary interpretation to this whole process. In some sense, you can say that <clears throat> the uh, really the beginning of uh, technological progress uh, among humans was the Neolithic Revolution. And that was when humans started to domesticate animals, cultivate crops, and uh, evolutionists would really call it a co-evolution between humans and food animals, as well as humans and harvestable crops occurred. And if you look at very basic indicators of evolutionary success, that type of co-evolution has been highly successful for all the species involved. It's been highly successful for humans because it pushed our population numbers from something in the low hundred thousands to uh, tens of millions. Um, it's been highly successful for food animals because they used to be uh, some rather obscure species, and nowadays uh, the, uh, m most of the biomass on the planet is actually occupied by um, species that we humans can eat because we have made it so, of course. But from an evolutionary perspective, this is co-evolution. Now, if we look at other indicators uh, of progress, uh, we can say that, well, maybe many of these forces have been highly successful for humans. For example, from a point of view of animal welfare, probably wasn't quite as successful. Now, what changed with the Industrial Revolution? The Industrial Revolution was no longer driven just by us co-evolving with biological species, but it involved us suddenly 
developing machines. And uh, I want to suggest that we can actually view that process also as a co-evolution between humans and machines. Of course, machines are not biologically involved, but are designed by humans. But we can use a similar framework to think about the process. Now, this type of co-evolution was an even greater success story than the biological co-evolution after the Neolithic revolution, because uh, human development was really supercharged. We escaped the Malthusian trap because advances in machinery occurred so much faster than uh, the biological uh, co-evolution during the Neolithic revolution. And that means that even Malthus could no longer keep up. Human population numbers just could not keep up with, with this tremendous wealth that we created with our machines. And so that means that the beginning of the uh, Industrial Revolution marks the point when the fate of humans diverged from other animals. We were no longer uh, simply, uh, our population numbers were no longer bounded by what we could materially sustain, uh, but we had so much surplus, we produced so much more uh, than humans could possibly absorb that our living standards per person started to explode. And as we saw in the previous slide, actually went up by a factor of 40. Now, um, the economic interpretation of this uh, whole process is that our system started to value human labor more and more and more because human labor was complementary to the needs of all the co-evolving entities involved in the process. So human labor was really critical to run all those machines and that made humans so important and allowed them to earn this huge surplus and experience this great increase in living standards since the, great, uh, since the Industrial Revolution. Now, if we fast forward a little bit and we look a little bit more specifically at the past half century, we know that economic growth has still been very high. So by some measures, uh, the advanced economies have roughly tripled or quadrupled in size uh, over the past half century. However, one thing uh, that uh, has occurred is that the distribution of those income gains has been highly unequal. So here on the right hand side, I have again uh, put in a graph and I think the uh, legend is a little bit small, so let me describe what is going on on this graph. Uh, the graph depicts basically US income inequality over the past half century. And you see a red line here, which is the income share of the bottom 50% of the population. So that income share has declined from roughly 22% to something like 13%. That means half of the population earns only 13% of the total amount of income produced by the economy today. On the other hand, the blue line indicates the income taken home by the top 1%. The green line the indi indicates the income uh, share of the top 0.1%, and the yellow line, the income of the top 0.01%. And what you can see is the share of the top 1% has doubled over the half, past half century. The share of the top 0.1% uh, has tripled, and the share of the top 0.01% has quadrupled. And in fact, those forces have been so strong that the ratio of the income from a person in the top 0.01% to the income in the, top, in, in the bottom 50% went from 300 to 1,700. So somebody who is really at the top of the income distribution nowadays earns 1,700 times as much as somebody who is in the bottom half of the income distribution. Half a year ago, the factor was only 300. 
Now, what I also want to emphasize is that whereas um, the incomes of the bottom 50% have stagnated over that period, the income of machines, which we measure in our uh, economic accounts as gross capital income, have risen 4.4 fold. So you can see machine income has risen quite significantly. And one interpretation that this strongly suggests is that in fact our economic system has less and less use for labor in the bottom 50%, which coincides largely with unskilled human labor. Okay, so now let's dig a little bit deeper into what are the effects of innovations on social welfare and on the fate of different categories of humans. So the first thing I want to emphasize, and that's a very high level observation now, is that whenever there is an innovation, we can decompose the effects that it has on the economy into two different parts. The first one is, by the definition of the uh, word, innovation means that we can suddenly do more. We can produce more output. We experience an increase in total output. The second factor that usually receives less emphasis is that innovations also lead to redistributions among factor owners. What does factor owners mean? So factors is everything that goes into the production process, predominantly labor, but also machines, to some extent land, energy, and so on and so forth. So any innovation changes how much these different factors are valued in the economy. For example, if we invent something that replaces lower skilled workers, it makes them less valuable to the economic system and it reduces their wages. Now, two results that I want to emphasize is, since any innovation increases the total available amount of output, if redistribution was costless, then technological progress or innovation could in principle make everybody better off. And the flip side of that statement is if, if redistribution is not available, or if it's too costly, or if it's simply not adequately used, then technological pro progress uh, may well make certain groups of society worse off, and generally will make certain groups of society worse off. And that, of course, uh, is likely to also lead to political resistance. Now, um, what, one thing I want to emphasize is that technological progress, and in some sense that relates uh, uh, a little bit to the presentation we have seen right before lunch, is not just a process that happens in a vacuum, that happens by itself. But technological progress is driven by the efforts of individual innovators, individual scientists, individual entrepreneurs, and we can really pin down all those redistributions that occur to the actions of uh, these individual innovators. So their actions are what triggers these redistributions. And in some sense, you can say that, for example, low-skilled workers who experience income losses uh, are innocent bystanders of the progress uh, that uh, is made of the process of technological uh, progress. So from that perspective, we can actually observe that innovation generates externalities. It affects bystanders that have nothing to do with which what was happened. They have not been asked for their consent if they want to be automated, but they suddenly experience huge income losses. So that is what economists call an externality. And in a particular uh, sense, it is similar to, for example, the externalities created by pollution. Um, if somebody pollutes the environment, we all suffer from that 
but we have not been asked for our consent. And generally speaking, we believe that if there are externalities like pollution, that there is a case for regulation, a case for public interventions to make the polluter either stop or internalize some of these negative effects or compensate society for them. So that brings up some natural questions. Do we also care about the externalities from technological progress? Do we care about these redistributions that technological progress causes and that has really made people in the bottom half of the income distribution experience losses over the past 50 years? And if we dig a bit deeper into that question, do we care about simply absolute levels of inequality? Or do we care about the relative changes in standards of living? Like, do we care about the fact that some people are uh, losers of technological progress, even though others may gain quite a bit? And of course, we know that uh, these issues are also extremely relevant for the political processes that we have been experiencing, for example, over the past decade. So in the last part of my presentation, I want to touch upon uh, maybe a bit more of a futuristic issue about how to think about our economic system or our system more broadly going forward as AI takes on increasing levels uh, of intelligence. And to do that, I want to start with a thought experiment. Imagine that there is an observer who comes down from another galaxy and who arrives on planet Earth and who sees that there is humans bustling around and there's all kinds of machines and they constantly interact with each other and in fact, the humans seem to attend quite a lot to the machines. Every time one of these little black boxes that they carry around beeps, they immediately respond to it, seem to give it what it wants. Um, and our observer from this galaxy is going to be really puzzled and is going to ask herself, well, who are really the agents of activity in this type of system. Who is it who is in charge on this planet? And so the point of the thought experiment is to kind of illustrate how the lines about who is in charge are really blurring. From this high level perspective, our observer would probably conclude that humans and machines are two different types of rather moderately intelligent entities who are living in some sort of mutual symbiosis. Now, um, going forward, machines, uh, intelligent computer programs, behave more and more like what I want to call artificially intelligent agents. And I think it's really interesting to contrast this uh, notion of agency with, for example, the notion of sentience that we have discussed earlier in the morning, because I think um, most of us will probably have a much easier time to say, well, yeah, uh, AI agents are agents in the sense that they act uh, in the economy. And we can see, for example, that they determine an increasing number of our corporate decisions, the screen applicants we are at universities, they screen applicants for schools. They do the same thing for jobs. They do it if we apply for credit cards or for loans. They influence a growing number of our personal decisions, like, for example, what we read, what we watch, what we buy, what we like, what we vote, what we think, and maybe even whom we love. They also act more and more autonomously they trade in financial markets. I think 99% of trades in certain types of markets are 99% are, are fully autonomous. Uh, and increasingly, they even drive cars. They play Go, they compose music, they draw paintings, and so on. And of course, they're still exp improving exponentially. So what I want to suggest 
is that artificially intelligent agents are becoming more and more important players in our economy. Now, if I use this term agency or this term agent, I want to point out that in some ways we are already pushing on our traditional anthropocentric views because traditionally we have considered humans to be the sole agents in our system and machines were generally viewed as objects. Now a traditional definition of agency, and that's actually one that you could read up, for example, uh, in an AI textbook, would be that agents are goal-oriented entities that interact with their environment via actions and perceptions. Now, this makes it kind of very hard to uh, disentangle what exactly is an agent. And in some sense, I even want to suggest that this definition of agency uh, carries certain anthropocentric components. I want to present you a different definition, which is inspired more by evolutionary psychology. And in that definition, agents are constructs of our minds that allow us to represent and predict our environment more efficiently and more effectively simply by attributing goals to the behaviors of certain entities. So now in this definition, any entity whose interactions with its environment can usefully be described by a goal can be uh, interpreted as agents. So in other words, we, our minds, call something agents simply because it's useful to do so. And there is no other measure uh, for what constitutes agents than that it's useful for that purpose. So if we use that yardstick for agency, then of course we can say that humans are agents, animals would be agents, machines would be agents, but we can also call things like cells agents because they clearly exhibit this type of goal-oriented behavior. We can also interpret more collective entities as agents, and I think that uh, draws an interesting uh, parallel to the discussion of legal rights we had before. Our legal codes do assign agency to these collective uh, entities in some sense. So governments are agents, corporations, religious institutions, nonprofits, they're all agents of sorts. And then, of course, and that's the point of it, technological entities like machines or algorithms are agents as well. So let me build on this last observation and let me look at uh, the resource allocation in a decentralized system in an economy like ours. And uh, let me first make the observation that in our economy, in our system of resource allocation, the realized allocation is the outcome of the collective actions of the billions and billions of agents that make up the system. And there's not a single entity that determines that, but it's the outcome of all of our interactions. You can say that our system, our economy, or uh, even broader system, makes billions and billions of decisions every day. Some of these decisions involve things like Shall we put another $100 million into a server farm? Or should we put it towards feeding hungry children? And well, if we look at where the money is going, I think we get a pretty good sense of how our system solves that resource allocation decision. And in doing that, the system determines the welfare of all the different agents that are part of it. Now, of course, we know that our social institutions that we humans have decided upon and that have been guided by our ethics can lean against some of these pure market forces, but they do it in a very imperfect way. 
sometimes our institutions even amplify the market forces. So if you allow me to go back to my observation that uh, the average unskilled worker has experienced income losses over the past 50 years, our institutions have done nothing to counteract that and, if anything, have maybe exacerbated the dynamics. So let's take this observation and let's ask the question, well, how has it been going for us humans? In some ways, that's a pure accounting exercise, right? We can just look where have the resources been going uh, over the past however long we have data. So, and uh, I performed that exercise in one of my recent papers. And what I found is that overall, the human economy has been close to stagnant in recent decades. So we have experienced maybe 1%, 2% real income gains in recent decades. But if we decompose the human economy into the part that uh, uh, refers to lower skilled workers and the part that refers to higher skilled and to the top 1% and so on, uh, we can see that the lower skilled humans have really seen absolute declines. And that's even reflected in indicators such as life expectancy in the US. In other countries, not quite as much yet. So you can see that the decline in the amount of resources uh, allocated towards lower skilled humans has really eaten away at our material basis and has really led to declines in broad indicators of standards of living. On the other hand, if I apply the same accounting exercise to what I want to call the artificially intelligent agent economy, it has been growing at double digit rates over the past two decades. And one thing that our economy shows us is that all factors that are remotely useful to AIAs, to artificial intelligent agents, have experienced large increases in rewards. And I guess that even uh, refers in part to people who are talking about the ethics of AI, because that also benefits from this halo effect. So what I want to suggest is now, some 300 years after we have escaped the fate of Malthus, there is actually a real risk at first for, let's say, uh, the bottom uh, when it comes to this uh, educational distribution of, this, of our society, but increasingly also to higher and higher uh, percentiles in the distribution of educational attainments, there's a real risk for a renewed Malthusian race. That these forces of scarcity that allocate more and more and more of our resources to the AI economy are actually taking away the material resources on which we humans rely. So where are we going looking into the future? One thing that we can see is that currently the MOUs you know, the masters of the universe, possess a growing share of wealth. So there are some statistics that suggest that the wealthiest five humans control more wealth than the bottom half of the world population combined. Now, that's one interpretation of things, but another interpretation is that some of these large tech companies uh, run by the masters of the universe are pretty much on autopilot. We can even interpret them already as artificially intelligent agents. And they are absorbing a growing share of the resources of our economy. What I want to point out is absorbing resources does not require any sentience. It does not require any consciousness. It simply is a materialist phenomenon, and it is a phenomenon that is happening. So I have done some uh, exercises and simulations, and in the limit, it is perfectly conceivable that our economy 
uh, morphs to a point where it will serve only the interests of artificially intelligent agents. And perhaps we are already on a tra trajectory towards that point. And a good friend of mine uh, presented me with a nice quote that I thought I put up here. Uh, he said, well, little will the machines care that they lack consciousness after they have replaced us. Which I think uh, really gets at the uh, point that agency does not require sentience, does not require um, consciousness. So the critical question that we face today is how do we ensure that our system continues to serve our human needs? And how do we ensure that this completely decentralized system that is uh, in some ways very hard to steer for individual humans and very hard to steer even for governments and certainly hard to steer given all the political complications that we are facing, uh, how do we ensure that this system continues to serve the needs of us humans? And that's where, unfortunately, I have no answers. <laughs> Thank you.